So this review is for a book that I read last year during a book challenge that I was doing. Last year was my challenge to increase the number of art related books on my Goodreads shelf. I did that challenge, a different child, personal challenge every year for a few years. I looked at the kinds of books that I really loved, but I didn't have too many on the shelf and I increased that number. So classic science fiction was one, marine, that's oceanic marine type books was another. And then in 2023, I tried to re increase the number of art related books, whether non-fiction, books about the Renaissance, or, for example, or fiction, which has art incorporated into the narrative. And in pursuit of that, someone on my Goodreads Reads friends list mentioned The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, as you will have seen on the fingernail, right? I didn't like this book, and it's the only book by that author I've read. It's probably going to be the only book by that author I ever read, based on my wet reading experience for this one. I recently mentioned either the author or the book in, a, in another review for something completely different, so now I'm going to review The Goldfinch and why I probably would climb over barbed wire naked to ever avoid reading anything by this author again. Preliminary comment is, however, that this author is good author. She writes well, just doesn't edit apparently every word that she ever wrote for this novel is in there all seven to eight hundred pages worth when really as a friend of mine said hi jd at 500 pages this would have still been a decent book at 400 pages it could have been an excellent book at 300 pages it could also have been an excellent book but at seven to eight hundred pages it's a for me do not finish. I did not finish this book. The extensive review I did for a non-finished DNF book was because I wanted to make sure that I never ever forgot this book and never ever revisited it. Now, allegedly the central commonality of this novel is a painting called The Goldfinch that was in an American New York museum did they americans do you call your art galleries museums i suppose you might um that the main character's mother really loved and kept going to see and that ended up in his possession illicitly while this painting is nicely described as are several other paintings and it does have a role it's like a theme that runs through the whole novel Neither the painting nor any other appear more than peripherally for hundreds of pages at a time. And oddly enough, it was often those pages that I enjoyed more than the ones that actually described the painting. So, as the back of the book will tell you, Theo as a child suffers a major life event in which a specific painting is central. So I'm not going to spoiler this. I don't, I don't really think you can spoiler this. It's been so widely disseminated and discussed and people just gushing over how wonderful it is. I really don't see that you can spoil it, but I'll do my best not to anyway. So yes, specific painting, the goldfinch being central. I enjoyed the early part of the book a great deal. The descriptions of paintings were good. The events which set up for the rest of the novel were interesting. And as it happened in New York, and I'm not terribly familiar with New York, and I don't read a lot of it Americana, it felt a little bit interesting and a little bit nice. I enjoyed that. So the first couple of hundred pages were very good. Theo then transitions to Las Vegas, where he goes through an erratic upbringing and schooling, which he shares with a friend who becomes pivotal to his life. I love the character of Boris at this stage, but while I did quite enjoy the Las Vegas thing, I like the way that Tart describes different towns New York felt very different to Las Vegas, they were both quite dynamically described. But at this relatively early stage, it's like, what, a third into the book, I was really starting to be a bit over Theo himself. And there was no element to this, art element to this section of the novel at all. Still, I did enjoy reading it, the author's description's vivid. 
And this section took us through to 300, upper 300 page count, I think it was. Now, next, Theo is back in New York. He grows to young adulthood in the next few decimals of pages, goes to school insipidly, becomes a partner in an antique business dishonestly. Here the painting becomes completely theoretical, an invisible and apparently senseless plot element in the washed out, senseless life that is Theo shambling through the pages. Lots and lots and lots of Theo shambling through the pages whining about things. Because, as you will realise, by now I am really, really over Theo himself. He is a believable character to some extent, to be sure. The author's writing ability, which is extensive, portrays him very adequately. He is also narcissistic, dishonest, unlikable, more than slightly creepy, and following him became very, very exceptionally painful. Now, I can't be sure if that is what the author is actually going for or not, but if so, I doubt her life choices. I shouldn't. She's done very well with this book. Better than I'd ever do with the book. But what is she trying to do here? Is she trying to make her, author, her readers really, really miserable? Is she trying to make them lo loathe Theo? You don't need hundreds of passages for that, Tart. You did it in five. Anyway. I just stopped wanting to read about him completely, and he was it. That was all you have. He bounces from one idiotic fix to another, sometimes wholly imaginary inside his warped little brain, but often formulated by his own dishonesty and his complete cowardice. They would all be, all these artificial circumstances that are created would be completely easily resolved if he just once in his life told the truth, but he seems constitutionally unable to do so at any time for any reason. This section mentions PTSD for the first time, and thank goodness, because I'd been muttering PTSD already under my breath for ages. The lovely of descriptions of New York and of antiques, which is where Theo dishonestly works, this kept me limping along for a while, but eventually I just had enough. Theo reminds me of no one so much as Bateman, the main character in American Psycho, in his complete lack of empathy, but unlike American Psycho, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of Theo to wade through, and nothing happening other than Theo moaning about how badly life's treating him. In the last few pages that I read, the plot, the painting, and the reemergence of Boris all suggested that a climax might be worth reading toward, but no, not doing it. After 603 pages, of forcing myself to pick up this book when I would rather clean the floor or do the laundry. I really literally couldn't cope any more with Theo. Any more of his idiocies, his internal whining for pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of whining. Someone slapped the idiot already. Basically, it could be a great book, nicely descriptive, good concept, believable characters. But with, it didn't have the necessary discipline to edit down the page number. And I really can't see why. This is a high profile author. She should be able to afford a decent editor. And she's obviously smart. The contents of the book may mean that she's an intelligent woman. How is she not intelligent enough to listen to the editor if she employs them? Anyway, as it is, the story is bloated, unwieldy, and downright annoying. Um... At page 603, I turned to my Goodreads community and reached out. Help me, I said. I have read much, this much of this book. It is annoying me to hives. I am getting hives from even picking up this book, let alone reading it. It is annoying me. It has eaten hours of my life that I could have spent doing literally anything more enjoyable, let alone any other book more enjoyable. Help me, I said. Should I keep reading? I've read most of it. Should I read those extra hundred or so pages? No, said my beloved Goodreads community. If you're not enjoying it, it's not going to get better. And at least one other person said, the ending is negligible. I resent having read toward it. Another person told me, it's worthless. It's wor it, it gets worse from there on. And I 
didn't quite believe them. I don't believe how at page 603 it could get worse, but apparently Boros re-emerging is the cue for worseness, and I don't want to know. I really, I can't deal with, I don't want to know. Now, one final footnote, and I could be very wrong about this, and if there's artistic type people out there who want to discuss it with me, would love to hear. I read this book because I was trying to read more books with artistic connections. So I'm quibbling over a small thing because maybe I missed something really obvious, but alternatively the author may have missed something really obvious. In the initial part of the book, Theo and his mother are somewhere in New York in a museum, which seems to be their version of a gallery, and they're looking at an exhibition titled Portraiture and Nature Morte. So that's um, Northern Masterpieces of the Golden Age. So the more Nature Morte was a beautiful theme in artistic history where elements of death were pictured. So you'd have dead things and skulls. It's really very gothic and gorgeous and beautiful paintings from that era. Now on page 22, Theo's mother, who has an art degree and a vast love of the subject, states that Franz Hals painted the Jolly Topa. Now I think, I'm pretty sure, that the Jolly Topa was actually painted by Judith Leister. Franz Hals had a number of portraits with tankards. He has one called the Merry Drinker, but they're not the portrait that is attributed to him in the book. Both artists are from the 17th century. Something doesn't add up there. Maybe it was discovered to be by Judith Leister after this book was written, but it's a fairly new book. I don't think that's the case. Anyway, any other art geeks out there who want to weigh in on the subject of the Jolly Topa, go ahead. If you are, most unlikely, or you like John Tart's writing, go for it. Anyone who writes books, well done. Anyone who reads books, love you automatically. This book is so not for me. If it is for you, probably a lot of the ones that I adore beyond measure aren't for you. It's just the way the world works. But I would literally rather chew my own toenails than read another five pages of this book. You could not offer me enough money, unless you're Bill Gates or Richard Branson. Then you probably could offer me enough money. But I don't think anyone else could. So, yeah, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. One of the worst examples of reading that I experienced in 2023. I one started because I couldn't give it negative stars. I will do my absolute best to never, ever persevere with a book I dislike so much for so long ever again. And thank you for watching.